I'd love to see a, a show of hands of people in the audience that are community managers or in some sort of a, a community capacity, day to day or part time. What about uh, those of you that are, are brands or businesses that are looking to activate communities or find ways to really tap into that ecosystem? So a handful of people there. And then I'm assuming everybody else is interested in meeting other people here and, and, and the topic in general. So I'm going to start off with uh, an aha moment that I had back in 2006. I had just exited a company in Australia that I started when I was about 17, 18 years old. I mean, I built that company over 10 years. It was within content marketing, um, primarily working with B2B customers um, and really looking at their customer acquisition and retention strategies. And uh, as Australians do, I went walkabout for a couple of years in search of my purpose. So, um, you know, I'd reached that 10 year point, having built this business, my 20s were just squandered into this business and then suddenly I emerged and realised that I was climbing the wrong mountain and I really needed to go in search of what my purpose was. And so, um, went walkabout for a couple of years all around the world meeting entrepreneurs and I happened to meet the, uh, the co-founders of a company called Zing. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Zing. It's kind of, it was the LinkedIn, LinkedIn of, of Europe at the time. It was OpenBC. And they had invited me to join that company. Number one, they wanted more diversity because they were purely, most of the people that worked there were, were, were Germans and they were building a global company. And they really wanted to understand where the value within their social network existed because at the time, in sort of 2005, 2006, social networks and communities were predominantly making their money through advertising. And it was great at the time because the CPM rates were really high, but they were like, look, there's got to be something a lot more authentic, a lot more valuable that exists within this social network. And we want you to help us discover what that is. So I was immersed into the world of the social web. I hadn't worked really with the internet in my previous 10 years. We were using email, well, email databases, but we were really tapping into communities that existed offline like here. And so what became really clear was that uh, social networks, in particular as they started to grow, the members created hundreds if not thousands of communities similar to, to Meetup. And so being a content marketer, it became very, very clear that an incredible amount of value existed within these communities that were being formed by the members. Now what was happening was that the leaders of these communities, similar to Layla and Nicholas, were um, constantly coming to us as a social network and asking us for help to connect them with sponsors, to connect them with content, to connect them with some form of value that would provide an experience to their membership base. And that was very challenging for us to do because there were thousands of these communities that existed around every topic that you can think of. And on the flip side, we had some very innovative larger brands like Hewlett Packard and IBM and PricewaterhouseCoopers being a business social network that were coming to us and saying, hey, there are all of these communities that exist that are relevant to our brand. We want to find ways to connect with those communities. You know, how can you help facilitate that to happen? So what became really obvious was there was a need within the market even back in 2006. And so we decided to run a series of experiments to test our assumptions around what would that dynamic look like where a brand could effectively engage with a community in a very authentic way. So <coughs> I created a community called Global Business Women because at the time being based in Europe, a lot of women were very hesitant about, they felt exposed within these social networks, Zing in particular, had a feature that at the time LinkedIn didn't where you could see who was looking at your profile and that would really freak them out. And so I'm like, all right, well, let's create a community called Global Business Women and really teach these ladies what ne networking is about and how they can really represent themselves and in a way protect themselves, not that there was a lot to be protected by. I mean, it was a very civil and professional community, but you know, people's perceptions are always different. So 
We created this community and 5,000 women had joined this community organically within six months. So the moment came where I felt it was right to start to test some of the assumptions that we had made. I, we'd nurtured that community every single week. The limited bandwidth that this community had um, we sent out a positive Monday booster because they were professional women. It was Monday morning and, you know, you know how we all feel on a Monday morning going to work. You need a little bit of a positive boost. And so we'd send out some kind of a newsletter with a, a short video or some inspirational quotes or a story and then the community would engage around that. So at the time, some of you may be aware of... The uh, Dove, I mean, Dove's really in the media at the moment. They've just released a phenomenal, um, not commercial, but a story uh, that really captures the perception that women have of themselves and what beauty means. But back in 2006, they produced a phenomenal video which uh, showed an average, ordinary, everyday woman that was transformed into a billboard model. And that was the image that women you know, resonated with and wanted to aspire to, but hey, there was so much Photoshop that was, that was done that it just wasn't real, yeah? And that video really profound, had a, a deep effect on me in terms of, yeah, like this is just, you know, this touches on something that is core to this community of global business women. No doubt that they've had um, conversations with themselves or with their daughters or with their peers about this topic. So I simply took the video and within the Positive Monday Booster, uh, the headline was uh, How Beauty is Made. You know, hey community, I just stumbled across this video. You know, go and watch it and how do you feel? Like what, what does it evoke in you and let's have a conversation about it. And so what was astounding was that this video was sent, it only took me t 10 minutes to put it together, this video was sent to 5,000 women and within 24 hours, 25% of the audience had watched that video. And for those of you that are familiar with marketing or digital advertising, getting people to actually pay attention is extremely difficult when you're doing, you know, through advertising. To have a 25% engagement rate is like mind-blowing, especially amongst, say, an audience of 5,000. What was even more astounding was that there were hundreds of comments. The first hundred comments weren't even like, oh, this is so profound. They were essays. These women had spent 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour writing their response and really wanting to discuss this topic amongst one another in this trusted environment. And that was really the moment where I realised that this is the future of how brands will engage with audiences that are relevant to them, where the brand actually has something of value to add to that community. And at the time, it was fairly abstract. You know, brands just weren't ready. They weren't mobilised. They didn't have budgets. They didn't have teams of people. Um, nor did they understand, you know, today the topic is around ROI and et cetera. It was just extremely experimentational and it was just way too early to, to be able to launch anything. And so, at the time, I'd read a book shortly thereafter. I mean, so, so I realised that that was the future and that that's the area that I wanted to dedicate my life to um, for various reasons. And so, at the time, I had met an author, you, you, some of you may know the book or you may even know the author because he's from Palo Alto, Rod Beckstrom. Does anybody know Rod Beckstrom or at least know the book, The Starfish and the Spider? Um, so this book, again, similar to the Dove experience, had a profound effect. The Starfish and the Spider is really a perfect analogy of what's going on in our world and what's going on in the social web. Um, we named our company Linkia, and it came from that book, The Starfish and the Spider. Linkia is a starfish that lives in the Great Barrier Reef, it also lives in other parts of the world. And Linkia is one of the most resilient starfish creatures, or creatures in the ocean. It's almost impossible to destroy Linkia. So much so that with all the environmental changes that w are going on around the world, there were too many Linkia starfish in the Great Barrier Reef. So, the marine biologist 
went into, I won't, I won't say the depths of the Great Barrier Reef because it's not too deep, but they went down there and they tried to reduce the numbers of linkia. They came back six months later and there were infinitely more starfish. And they're like, what's going on? We were here only six months ago and we destroyed half of the population of these starfish and now there's five or ten times more of these starfish. What's really unique about linkia is that when linkia starfish lose a part of its body, not only does the starfish regenerate, but the piece that came off creates a new starfish. It's a decentralised organism. The only way that you can destroy a linkia starfish is to poison it, which is what the marine biologists did. And the analogy is against the spider, which looks like a very scary creature um, that looks dangerous. You know, it has a head, it has eight legs, but what happens when you actually, when one of the legs comes off, it doesn't grow back. In fact, the, the spider becomes vulnerable. If it loses all of its legs, it will probably die, but it will become completely uh, immobile. It has no power whatsoever. You cut off its head and it dies. And so, within the book, the authors relate the starfish and the spider to organisations in our world today, whether it be governments, whether it be corporations and companies. And their belief is that the starfish organisation really has the greatest potential to thrive. And so in the offline world, if you think about way back to um, uh, the Apache Indians, yeah, or you think about Alcoholics Anonymous, or you think about Wikipedia, they are starfish organisations, completely decentralised, and what they thrive on is their ideology. So the only way that you can destroy those organisations is to poison their ideology. And so what became clear, the, 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 the next aha moment was, well, communities on the web are very much like the linkier starfish. They form, people gather around a common passion, a common interest, and then for some reason, maybe that community is not relevant to you right now, so you break away, and maybe you go and create a new community. But that's why today we have tens of millions of communities that exist out there every day. Communities evolve, they're born, and communities die and fade away. But what really enables these communities to thrive is their ideology. And the more powerful that ideology is, the more powerful that community becomes. So. That became the analogy in terms of the, uh, the starfish. So what we've seen happen over the last three, uh, over the last three years, you're probably all familiar with the concept of blogger activation, blogger outreach. Um, and we get asked this by brands all the time, like what's the difference between bloggers and communities? Well, there's not that much of a difference because many of the communities today are uh, do have a leader or an individual that has a very active, thriving blog. But what's happened over the last three years is that many new social networks or existing social networks have become stronger and started to evolve. And so community leaders such as Chrissy Page, she invests around about 24 hours a week into her community, sorry, not 24 hours, um, 20 hours a week into her community. You know, communities um, that are run by individuals like Layla where consistently they're investing time and they're not just engaging an audience within one channel, wherever their audience exists, they will sense where that audience exists and their mission is to nurture and grow their audience around that common interest. It becomes a much more dynamic, a much more flat structure where it's not just about, hey, this is my opinion, this is my story, you can comment on it, and that's about it. You know, with Facebook, with Twitter, with Pinterest, there are multiple ways that the whole community can engage and participate in that conversation or in that topic, and that's where a significant opportunity exists for brands because brands will never be able to keep up with where those audiences are, where's the next social network that you know, Sally is spending more time in, they're not going to be able to keep up. So really, the opportunity lies with individuals like Chrissy Page, who's passionate about parenting, or Emily Clark, who's passionate about home and garden. She has a reach of approximately 12 and a half thousand that she's built over, say, four or five years. Some of these communities that we've seen 
amass to 40, 50,000 members. You know, it really depends on what is it that they're talking about and how does that content spread and attract attention of potential um, community members that then come and join that conversation. But it is a very fluid ecosystem. Or if we have a look at Laura Boswell, who runs a fashion community, she has a reach of 30,000. Um, these community leaders are curating anywhere from 10 to 20 stories a week. You know, it's quite a task. And in most cases, they're doing it because they love it, not because somebody's come to them to say, I'm going to pay you to build this community. That very rarely happens. It's not to say that they shouldn't get paid for their efforts, but it's the whole concept of do what you love and the money will follow. And that's really the opportunity that has started to surface within this whole community ecosystem. So our belief and what we've seen over the last eight years, my co-founder and I, is that communities that have a reach between 10 and 50,000, and this specifically relates to communities where there would be an interest to match them with a brand, and a brand would be interested in activating those audiences. They might appear large compared to a community of this size, but you've got to understand that, that in the past few years, brands have predominantly been focusing their energy, time, resource into communities that reach hundreds of thousands or millions, the Huffington Post or the A-list bloggers. That's all very well and good, but realistically, how many of those relationships can a brand manage at any one point in time? We were at General Mills last week and they're like, we can really manage only 12 or 13 of those relationships. So what happens to the thousands of communities that are out there um, that the brand isn't able to effectively reach out to? And communities that have a reach between 10 and 50,000 um, or even smaller, the dynamic is much more intimate, it's much more engaged you can actually have, as an audience member, a conversation or an interaction with that community leader and not feel like they are a celebrity or a superstar or, you know, they're like one of you. And, that, and, and it's that dynamic that really brings this to life. Um, so what we've also found is that the audience that participates in these, these, these niche communities, we call it the mid to long tail of communities, they're far, they become a far better potential customer or a potential member um, for an organisation because once you have had an emotional experience within a community around a brand story, such as the Dove example that I gave, when you're at the supermarket and you're looking at different products and suddenly you see Dove and it triggers that emotional experience you had, the fact that you spent half an hour responding to that story or reading those stories, then you're no longer really looking at price. You're really looking at the emotional experience that you have with that product and that's essentially what it is that you're purchasing. So we've found by working with um, you know, over 150 campaigns that we've launched, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit more around that, that what we're seeing is that clients are coming back to us and they're stating that, hey, you may not drive the same volume of traffic that Google search will, but the people that do come from these communities spend a lot more money. They stay within our database or our email marketing program or our communities much longer, and they do become a better customer. They're more likely to refer to their friends, etc. And we're still in the very early, early days of, of trying to understand what that path to purchase is because it's a very grey area where you start to mix selling a product as opposed to you know, a community that's very organic, that's talking about a very inspirational topic such as self-esteem. You don't want to mix too much about, hey, here's a deodorant and here are the benefits of using this deodorant. They, it's like mixing oil and water. So we believe that the most effective way for brands, businesses and organisations to uh, reach audiences that matter to them is through storytelling. It's not through advertising, it's through pure storytelling. And so, if, uh, before I get on to that, so <clears throat> the two options that brands have today to reach audiences within social, which is where we're spending most of our time, 
Number one, they're building their own channels. They're building their own Facebook pages. They're building their own Twitter streams, their own meetup groups, etc. Secondly, they are leveraging social advertising um, you know, tactics, uh, whether it be through Facebook ads or through Facebook sponsored stories or through Twitter, YouTube. I mean, every social network is trying to figure out what's that mass, um, what's that mass offering that we can enable brands to reach audiences at scale. Okay, like we, you know, brands want to be able to reach 10 million people at once. And so the challenge that brands are facing, and they've been doing that for extensively for the last, say, two years, is that when they place an, ad when they place an advertisement, at best, they're getting 0.05 to 0.1% of people actually clicking on that advertisement. You know? And that really says a lot about the traffic or the, the audience that's engaging within the blog or within the uh, Facebook page or wherever it is that they are. So they're not seeing the results. Um, within their own channels, they've paid millions of dollars to acquire these fans. And if you have a look at the statistics that are out there, the best brands are engaging maybe 2% of that audience. And if you want your stories to appear in your activity stream, if you're a fan of that brand, they're going to have to pay for that. Yeah, it's like a slot machine. They just keep having to put more money into it. And they're becoming disillusioned and they're becoming angry and they're just becoming extremely disappointed with this ecosystem going, hey, we've got all of these valuable fans. We have no way to activate a high percentage of them, 25, you know, 50 percent, etc. So brands have this urgent need to reach audiences that are not in their own channels and that they can't reach through advertising. So what they've realised is that these communities are extremely powerful um, in terms of creating awareness and inspiring people to take action. They also realise that they can no longer be creating advertisements like healthy hydration without sugar and calories with a water bottle and learn more. I mean, there's not, you know, Nestle is actually one of our clients, but there's nothing really terribly inspiring about that advertisement. What they've realised is that if they want that ticket to play or to participate in the conversation, they have to bring something of value. They really need to understand what is the needs of that audience and they need to either inspire that audience, educate them, entertain them, or inform them about something. But they really need to know what that audience needs and then they create content, such as in this case, you can see that Nestle were very clever. They wanted to reach mums in California and have a conversation about water. This is one of the most controversial states when it comes to bottled water. And so as you can appreciate within their own channels, there's a lot of negative comments that are going on, like, you know, why use bottled water when you can get water out of the tap? And you know, so th what they've done is they've tackled the issue head on and said, hey, we recognise this is a problem. Bottled water is not going away. So what we're going to do about it is obviously use recycled materials within our bottles. But more importantly, there's a greater issue that exists, and that is that 2.8 billion bottles are not being recycled every year. They're going into landfill. So mums, let's have a conversation around what the environment means to you. How do you engage your family? How do you engage your community? What do you do around recycling to make those small incremental steps? Because whether it be bottled water or any form of packaging or anything that harms the environment, it's not going to go away. So how do we create an ecosystem around that? And so what they produced was a series of content assets that were informative, that had facts and then they enabled the, the community leaders to share those stories. So, in order for brands to be, they realise the power of unleashing their stories, such as 2.8 billion bottles are going into landfill, and their content, they realise that putting it in the hands of these storytellers is extremely powerful. The challenge that they have is that they don't have a PR agency, they don't have a marketing company, they don't have any resources internally to tailor their message 
to 200, 500, 1,000 different communities. So the bridge is identifying communities where that particular story and those content items, where it, it's a fit within those communities. And communities is really where these storytellers live. They're curating 10 to 20 stories a week. So enabling these storytellers and supporting them in their quest to get content, it's not easy to find 10 to 20 stories every week. So why not join um, in the process of helping these storytellers share great stories by providing them with great content and an idea to, uh, to engage their audience around? And when that's done effectively within these vertically focused, highly contextual and very engaged communities, when that is done effectively, then the outcome is really extraordinary. The audience starts to uh, share, like, even go and create their own stories. We're talking about hundreds of stories that can inspire thousands of different actions. And what's even more extraordinary about that is it becomes permanent, unlike an advertisement that disappears when your budget runs out. Not that anyone's taken any notice of it. These storytellers are creating content that lives on forever within the social web if they are great quality stories and something that people are searching for. So I came across this, uh, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know who the author is, and I did have every intention to, to, uh, to research who the author was, um, but I can follow up afterwards. So this is not, this is not our work. But when I, when I stumbled across this last week, it really brought home the dynamic that's happening, that's, that's happening within this ecosystem of brands and their quest to engage with people um, that have already, they've already got a relationship with or people that they're looking to have a relationship with. So if you think about a brand who's in the middle, their first circle represents people that love them. These are the people that are already fans. These are the people that you can share any type of content. It could even be a coupon. It could be an ad. And those people will just blindly react, engage with it. And so those people typically already live within that brand's customer community or within their fan page and uh, they are heavily promoting and talking about that brand on a regular basis. And what happens is that when those individuals share their love for the brand, then their friends blindly follow in a way, like if, if whatever the brand is and whatever the um, offering is resonates with the friend, it's like, right, I don't need to, you know, I've got so much going on in my life, I don't need to make a decision about 20 different products I can choose from, I'm just going to go with that solution. So by default, the second circle become infected by the, the, uh, the love of the, the fans that are in that first circle. But really, the holy grail for brands lies within the third circle because if you have a look at the population just of the United States, you know, a brand isn't, doesn't have that love relationship with every single person within the country. A brand is always looking to reach new markets. So the third circle, a brand has to earn the right to get your attention and for you to get action, for you to take action. And the only way that's going to happen is if the brand understands what's your pain point, what's your need, what makes you tick, You're observing the dynamic of that audience, and then understanding that that audience lives within these interest communities based on that individual's passion or interest. So it could be a parenting community that's focused on healthy living. When a brand identifies that that community has an audience that they want to establish a relationship with, they know what the needs of that audience is, then they need to become experts at curating uh, content, curating stories that's really going to resonate with that audience to get the attention. And once they've got your attention and you've taken the action to go, yeah, I'm going to sign up to that email newsletter because I want to receive ongoing recipes every week because gluten-free is important within my family. And so if you can help me with that conversation, Pillsbury or whichever brand it is, um, then I'm willing. I'm willing to start dancing with you. And so uh, email capture is actually one of the most effective ways 
for brands to build a relationship with individuals within that third circle because they, you're giving them the brand permission to continue engaging with you. And then when a brand is really smart and clever, they'll start to weave in very subtle calls to action to slowly drive you into be becoming a customer. And then you can go and hang out in the Facebook page and be potentially become part of that first, uh, that first circle. So this is really the dynamic that we're seeing evolve. It also really touches on the point of the difference between fans um, or advocacy programs and influencer programs. Yeah, so if you're using clout or you're identifying individuals that can advocate on behalf of your brand, and there are many providers that are out there, such as Badgeville, such as CrowdTap, such as Clout and Cred, they're fantastic programs to activate your fans. And how you activate them is an entirely different program. But brands must not get confused and use the same tactics to identify and engage with influencers because influencers may not necessarily be mad, passionate fans of the brand. What the influencers are looking for is really valuable content and information to be able to add value to, to, to their audience. So <laughs> let's have a look at some, some stories. I don't know if you can see this uh, on screen. Um, <clears throat> this is a really delicate balance between, you know, we, we're strong believ believers of, there are, there are influencer programs out there that go to communities and they go, here's our product, we want you to do a product review. Um, brands uh, find product reviews very short-lived, especially in, in a way where, where there's some sort of a value exchange going on. It's sponsored, you know, the audience is very sceptical about it. Um, and also what's happening within the ecosystem is that, that you know, for, for big brands like Nestle and General Mills, they're seeing an infiltration of couponing and discounts associated with key search terms around their product. And it's not really a great way to leave that positive first impression. So a great example of a brand is uh, method cleaning. Um, and I'm sure that you're, you're, most of you are, are familiar and aware of method cleaning. They're actually uh, based out of San Francisco. And there's a tremendous love that actually does exist around this brand. And so they came to us and they really wanted to tap into communities of moms and um, fashion and home and garden type of communities. Um, and in this particular example, um, every single month they have a different theme and their stories unfold. Um, this month it's, 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 it's all about doing good. But for this particular month, they partnered with designer Orla Keeley. And the theme of their story was a pretty pair. So as a community leader, whether you're a mother, whether you're a fashion designer or an interior decorating, what does the theme a pretty pair mean to you? And using, being inspired by these beautiful geometric designs and colours, you take your pick in terms of write whatever story it is that you want to write about to engage your audience. And so here are examples of just five stories, but you can imagine if 100 or 200 of these communities were to share the story, you're not seeing that cookie cutter approach. Every single story is going to be unique. Whether it be a community that matches the orange um, patterns with her orange bathroom, or the parenting community that matches her daughter who's dressed in these geometric patterns and you know they're actually animated, these, these beautiful photographs. Um, or a fashion designer that starts to pair the, the different colours and geometric themes with different fashion accessories. That suddenly becomes interesting content for that audience. And what we spoke about just earlier, so this is not just about bloggers, blogger outreach, you know, these, these, these um, bloggers then start to share those stories across Facebook. Um, what we see happen within Facebook is that you know people start commenting and liking. Um, another really important point to mention is that brands don't have the resource to create so many different types of content. So what we're seeing is that 90% of the content that's created by these uh, is created by communities. So think about you know, 20, 50, 100 communities where the leaders are going out there taking photographs, taking videos. How incredibly 
valuable is that for a brand? And that's not something that they're actually paying for. Um, they then, the community leaders then share the uh, conversations on Twitter. What we're finding is that communities will use different channels in a different way. For example, Twitter will be used to promote the blog story or to um, promote a particular, like if, if, you know, if a brand is looking to take a pledge about drinking more water this summer or take a, sign a petition against bullying, then Twitter is a fantastic channel to be able to activate those audiences to get them to take action. Um, and then obviously with stories that are visually rich, then Pinterest becomes a, a, a phenomenal channel to enable those stories to be shared. There's one particular story um, that we unleashed f uh, to design communities from One King's Lane. And, uh, and this story has over 100,000 repins. I mean, that's not something that you can replicate with every single community, but really that's what the brands are striving for, is for the audiences to resonate with that content and share the content. So what we decided, well, you know, back in when I had that aha moment, <coughs> I really set out on a mission to identify the most active, thriving communities that exist on the web, understanding that it was a huge undertaking because these communities evolve on a daily basis, they die on a daily basis, how do you actually keep track of where these communities are? And so, um, was you know, spent about four or five years trying to understand the dynamic between the brands and the communities um, and, and, and really uh, facilitated these relationships without any form of technology whatsoever. It was all about understanding the tiny little nuances that would bring this ecosystem to life. With something like this, the devil's in the detail. You get the detail wrong and your entire business model can collapse and we'll start we'll see that happen for some of the players that are out there i won't mention any of them but you can already start to see the warning signs by not appreciating the details of how these uh, community ecosystems in particular how they thrive they can easily be damaged if you approach it the wrong way so linkia is really about helping brands share their stories and their content across interest communities within blogs, Twitter, Facebook, whichever channel. We're completely channel agnostic. And we're on a mission to identify the top 100,000 communities um, in North America within a few different verticals. And these communities eventually, once we identify the active thriving communities, reach an audience in excess of the largest social network. But what's really extraordinary about these communities is everybody is gather, gathering around their interest or their top, uh, the topic that they're, they're, they're interested in. And of course, by being able to map out this ecosystem, we're matching brands and their stories to the most targeted communities in a very seamless way. We incorporated the company in November 2011. We raised about four and a half million dollars in funding. And I should say that I, uh, I gave birth to my first child um, back in August 2011, I was in a board meeting eight hours later and I was told that I had a week to raise the first million dollars <laughs> in order for this idea to, to survive and thrive. So uh, it was quite painful getting to this point. Um, but really, I think if you're creating anything magical, there's always a very thorny journey along the way. And as you can see now, we're expecting our second child and I, uh, I expect that we'll probably be raising our B round at that time if the universe <laughs> collides. So um, we, uh, we have a team of around about 15 people right now, predominantly in engineering, um, brand success, really people that are dedicated to understanding now on a technological level, you know, how does, how does, this, uh, how does this ecosystem come together? Here's just an example of some of the customers that we work with. So what we set out to do is we built a team of people that helped us in building a search engine similar to what Google did with mapping out web, the, the, the web, web pages. Um, we built a discovery engine and this discovery engine crawls the web and we identify, okay, is this a community? And then it goes through 10 or 15 different pieces of criteria such as what is this community talking about? Is it about parenting or fashion? What are the subcategories? What are the discussions that are taking place? How is there a, a, a person that we can actually identify that owns this community? Because we don't call these people up and say, hey, do you want to participate in, um, in sharing a story? You know, this really needs to be done at scale. 
Um, we understand um, how many stories these communities post every week, how the audience reacts to those stories, um, and so on. So, you know, what's the reach of those communities? How fast are these communities growing? So we've built technology that's able to map out pretty much any type of community in any type of vertical. And then we've built a matching engine so that we can have a brand that will call us like last uh, last Thursday we had a brand call us and say we need to activate a campaign um, and we need 250 communities you know and you need to, we need to be able to do that in a very short period of time a process that would normally take maybe four or five people six months <laughs> maybe slightly less um, we need to be able to do that in a very short period of time. And then once we activate these campaigns, we actually automatically reach out to communities that we've matched the brand to. The brand also gets a choice. They don't, they don't, they're not forced to work with every single community. They can, can pick and choose their communities. So we reach out to them in an automated way. And ultimately, our goal is to understand what is the business result that each community or collective of communities deliver for a particular brand. So what, what I mean by a business result is that there's also been a shift and a lot of pressure. If you have a look at how many dollars are going into connecting with audiences online or through mobile, um, Mary, um, Mary Meeker, is it Mary Meeker from um, Kleiner Perkins released a you know, the state of play, and I was reading that the, the other night, and it's like $62 billion, you know. And so businesses, brands, organisations are looking at parking significant sums of money into social, and it's really sad that a large percentage of that is going into advertisements that are getting that 0.05 to 1%. To so we really want to put that money to better use, and we realise that whilst communities are very delicate ecosystems, and we play that guardian of ensuring that the brands play by those rules, um, that they do have business results that they want to achieve. So business results simply means that, hey, I've got one story, and I want the story to spread across a number of different communities, um, and so I want content to be created. We're really looking for beautiful photographs or videos or stories or conversations. Um, why is that important? Because it impacts SEO. Brands are own and businesses are only waking up to the point, and this isn't about link building. This is about using key phrases like, how do I, how do I um, ensure that my family is hydrated this summer? or whatever the key phrases are that the audience is looking for, it's so simple to have those weaved into those stories, especially when you're activating 250 communities at once. And from an SEO standpoint, brands start to see the impact within the first three days. And then they still see the impact 12 months later. Go and Google Dasani recycling and stories will still appear in the first three pages of results that were shared 12 months ago. So this really is when, you know, when the existing author talks about the Holy Grail. Um, they might be looking to drive trial or purchase. That's a little bit more tricky because a lot of people aren't ready to jump and take their credit card out and spend. But it can be done in a very delicate way and we have been seeing some results there. Lead generation is really one of the most effective ways to capitalise. You know, you, you could literally just go out there and say, Hi, I just want all these stories shared. But because these communities do such a wonderful job of sharing stories, they're going to inspire you to take action. Yeah, you want to take that next step. So brands realise that and they can start to build their, their email databases and eventually move those individuals into customers and into their fan communities. Um, they're looking for audiences to take action. It might be to sign a pledge, to watch a video, to download an app, to take some form of action. And if all of those variables come into place, and it's not to say that a brand is looking for every single one of them, but if a brand has a phenomenal story like self-esteem, they're producing content like a toolkit, they've identified that they want to uh, reach out to 15 million teenage girls and they're providing a phenomenal user experience, what's going to happen is that those audiences will start to engage and those messages will be amplified. So I'm just going to give you a very, and we're almost at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a, a, a sneak peek into the platform that we've built. It's very simple. 
It's, uh, it's actually not rocket science, but it did take a number of years to figure out what the, what the detail is. So um, it's really just a three-step process to activate a campaign. The time that brands are ready to come to Linkio, they get access to a, a dashboard. They have access to that, that, that dashboard 24-7. Um, they've already got the story theme, they've already got their content assets, they know that they want to reach a specific type of audience, so they're ready to activate. So they start off by creating a campaign. And when they create the campaign, step number one is, okay, show me all the different communities you have. I mean, this is a very general search term, but show me all the communities you have around mums or around um, mums in California that are talking about sustainability. We then show them all the different uh, communities that, that could be a, a, a possible match to them. And they simply just start adding those communities to their shopping basket. Um, how we actually price these communities is, is interesting. Um, you're probably all familiar with the whole concept of the sponsored post, where you pay a community leader up front a couple of hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, fifty dollars, even thousands of dollars. They go and write the story and then that's it. You probably won't, won't hear from them again unless you come back and pay them more. So we don't actually believe in paying community leaders to post. They're already doing that every day. We actually believe that if we can bring them powerful, really great, valuable content, we're really um, you know, adding value on that front. But when the audience engages with that content and takes an action and clicks through to the brand website, then the brand should pay for that and the community leaders should get paid for that because the brand would otherwise be paying Google or some other ad network. So we put a premium on that price and it is a cost per click model. We get paid for results delivering that traffic and the communities and we, we share a healthy percentage of, this isn't about them getting like you know a few cents or, or a few percent, we, we share a really high percentage with these communities. So every single community has a budget assigned to them and then they have to achieve on that milestone. If they underperform, they only get paid for what they achieved. They need to go back to the drawing board and maybe do a better job of sharing better stories. You know, it's really all about, this is true influence. This isn't necessarily, you know, I mean, I've got a, a high clout score around social media and yeah, I mean, I've got some idea about social media, but to be honest with you, I'm not writing a lot about social media. The only reason I have a high clout score is, uh, and in all due respects, I absolutely think the world of clout and what they're doing because they're paving the way for something that's so important. But I share a lot of photographs of my daughter and that automatically, you know, I get perks like every week because <laughs> I share photographs of my daughter. But if you have a look at it from a pure business perspective, what is the action that a community can drive? If they've done a great, great job in sharing the story, people start to take action that really is true influence. Yeah, it's the ability to deliver that potential customer to, um, to the client. Now, if they overperform, then their budgets increase. So we have had some communities that have started on a budget of like $60. The following week, they've been at $2,500. Now, that's an exception. On average, communities are paid between about $150 to $300 but it's entirely up to them in terms of their ability. They're not set, their budgets are not set in concrete. So we're finding that that business model works. We've been able to attract some really amazing brands that go, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I actually know what it is that, that, that I'm getting for, for my investment. The next step is the elevator pitch. The brand has about 30 seconds to inspire a community leader to say, yes, I wanna share this story. So they describe what their story is about, how the audience will benefit. Another key differentiator that we really um, discovered was that campaigns need to run for two to four weeks because what's really valuable is that a brand has direct access to the community leader. And by having direct access to the community leader, they have the opportunity to nurture that relationship over a two-week period where it doesn't become transactional, like, hey, go and post this story and then that's it, see you later. You know, we're running away. What brands are actually doing is nurturing those relationships with community leaders because they're looking to activate them over and over again. So they describe what their opportunity is about, what the objectives, their business objectives are. It's all about transparency, having full transparency there. And then finally, they upload their content assets. So they're not uploading advertisements, they're uploading images, videos, links, supporting text. 
On average, brands will provide 15 to 25 pieces of content and communities have total freedom in terms of what they choose to share. Nobody's made to do anything. This is all built on permission-based marketing principles actually, both for the brand and both for the community leader. It's coming up with an equitable model. And at that stage, the brand is ready to launch their campaign. So it literally takes them about 10 minutes, a process that would normally take months. Once a campaign launches, then every single one of those communities receives a message from Linkia and the common question we get asked is, well, do those individuals have to be registered to your platform? No, they don't. We're not limited by our inventory. As a matter of fact, we have just over 2,500 communities reaching an audience of about 70 million that are registered to Linkia. But then the onus is on us because once a community participates in a campaign, then we want to be able to offer them stories on a monthly basis. So it is a little bit of a chicken and an egg scenario when you start off with something like this very new, but we can literally go out to an ecosystem of 100,000 communities and invite them to participate. And once you actually build that trust within the market, we're seeing anywhere from 50 to 80% of communities opt in that have never heard about us. And so it really is an effective way for brands to get that cut through. So community leaders receive the message and within minutes they come and they, they, they review the opportunity so you can see the, the elevator pitch there, the campaign at a glance. They then review their content items as well as the uh, instructions. Um, and then, this is, this is something that we found extremely powerful, We've created a private community or an activity stream around that story, around that campaign, where community leaders can engage with one another and they can also engage directly with the brand. So brands really use this as an opportunity throughout the campaign to, and I don't like to call it a campaign actually, it's more of a program because it's not like traditional advertising. Um, they, they, they have the opportunity to, to spark new conversations. So for example, Method would spark a conversation around Earth Day if it happened to be in the middle of the campaign. Every single one of those community leaders are notified that. It really streamlines the whole process and it doesn't take more than five minutes a day for a brand to be able to manage this. So we're really solving a major problem for them. Once a communities, uh, it takes them about one or two minutes to evaluate whether the story is right for their community and it re those stories really do need to be authentic. Um, as I mentioned, there's stories around hydration or around bullying. They're very rarely ar around the specific product, yeah? And so we do see a very high uptake of communities. But hey, we have run campaigns for major brands where community leaders have said, no, I'll never do anything with that brand. I just, you know, they use um, genetically modified products or for whatever the reason they have. They actually provide a reason when they, when they decline because the brand is interested in knowing that. So the communities opt in. And immediately they start sharing on Twitter, on Facebook. By the third day, 60% of communities have shared their, their blog story. Um, and then the engagement continues over that two to four week period. The brand is able to track real time how many communities are participating, what's my total reach, how much traffic is being driven from these communities? What's the quality of that traffic? How is it converting? Are people signing? Are they opting in to our email list or our newsletter? Are they um, taking the pledge? Are they signing the petition? Are they watching the video? And sometimes a campaign or an, an initiative may not be going as strongly as what was anticipated. So they have the opportunity to optimise real time. We've seen some clients swap out landing pages. I mean, this is more like traditional marketing um, tactics that they would deploy. But it is very done in a very natural and respectful way. We've even seen cases when the brand will go to the communities going, hey, this isn't working. Can you please advise us on what it is that we need to do? And that level of trust is phenomenal. I mean, that's, that's, really, that's really what it is that community leaders are looking for. So we provide some additional analytics, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of uh, brands have the capability to drill down. Because when you're activating 200 communities, maybe you want to really pinpoint what are the top 50 communities that have curated beautiful stories that have driven the best results. You know, they, they start to create um, an opportunity to engage with those communities on, on, on a more regular basis. So that pretty much concludes 
uh, what it is that, that, that we stand for, which is all around storytelling, it's all around community, respecting and really valuing the, the catalyst, the community leader, understanding that these community leaders are driven by their passion, that what they're really after is recognition, you know, they really want recognition for the 10 to 40 hours that they invest in the, to their communities every week. They want help with content. They want to be able to continue to share stories. And they want to form relationships with brands that they would never have the opportunity to form a relationship with because perhaps their community only has a reach to 15,000. So suddenly, by being able to partner with these larger brands, it makes them look really good amongst their audience because they, they have that social kudos. So respecting that these dynamics exist, as well as all the dynamics that exist around a brand, brands are still trying to figure it out, but they're very trusting, they're very open. It's surprising to see some of the largest brands in this country that were the spiders that are now shifting into being the starfish. They're completely changing their mindset as to how they're, they're um, approaching this extremely valuable ecosystem. And what's wonderful for us being in the audience uh, or, or members of these communities is that we get to extract value out of that. We get to watch videos like Dove that move us and maybe inspire us to have a conversation with our daughters or with the teenage girl that lives next door that might be going through some self-esteem issues. We want to be able to walk away and really be able to provide some value to our lives or the lives of our families or communities and if a brand has been able to facilitate that, then that's absolutely fantastic and brands realise that that's what, what it takes. That's, that's the ticket that they need to um, play the game. So um, I thought I'd also just take this opportunity to share with you if you've been inspired by, uh, by the story that we are a young company, you know, we are hiring and um, we are looking also for, for you know, a pretty magical role, the community manager, which is all around um, designing how we, how we onboard these communities into the ecosystem, how we nurture these community leaders. You know, it's, we, we like to say that imagine being at, at the epicentre of a billion people's passions because that's ultimately the, the place that we will be very soon. Um, we're also looking for somebody to help um, manage some of these initiatives, campaigns that we're, we're launching. We call that brand success. And that's extremely exciting because a lot of it really is having the innovation hat on and trying to determine what the patterns are and, and how, how can we really increase the uh, success for both the brands and the communities. Um, we're also looking for a, uh, a sales executive. I mean, I, I pretty much handle most of that, but I'm drowning in that work right now. And uh, like every other startup in the valley, we're looking for engineers. So if you or you know anybody that's interested, then we truly believe that this is a, um, an exciting opportunity. It's going to be one amazing journey for the next few years, however many, two, five years. But, um, you know, obviously we need some smart, passionate people to come along for the ride. So I invite you to, to come and chat with me afterwards. Thanks, Maria. Um, yeah. Okay. So before we open it up to Q&A, I just wanted everyone to participate in the contest, please. Um, and I wanted to just get a show of hands. How many of you here are community managers? Uh, half. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That means my meetup actually showed up, not just. Okay. And um, I wanted to also, because this presentation was so much focused on Linkia, so before, um, you know, we have a few minutes before we announce the winners. I wanted to see if, if any of you wanted to talk about, um, you know, your community and what techniques you're using to activate your community influencers, what's making, you know, what's making your community evangelist excited to be your evangelist. If any of you feel like sharing, feel free. Otherwise, if you have questions for Maria, go, go for it. And then I will get the, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and um, see how the contests are going. <laughs> Do we have any questions? No. Yes? Go ahead. Thank you, Maria. Wonderful presentation. Uh, this obviously addresses corporate brands and corporate brand stories. And we're looking at a rise of awareness of how important it is to have a personal brand. So if you're an individual that's wanting to build support for a cause, for a product or service, 
what what's your I guess vision for individuals or small groups with a vision? Yeah, so we, we've, we've built into our vision. I mean, r when, when you're a startup and you're in operation sort of for the first six to 12 months, then you're under a lot of pressure to stabilize your platform and your offering and really you get that positioning within the market. So today we, we really have no choice but to work with mid-size to larger brands in order to get to that point where I feel most passionate about and that is it could be the local San Francisco coffee shop that wants to connect with five coffee-loving communities. Um, it's a self-service. They can come to the platform, they can identify those communities and even if they wanted to approach those communities directly, it's perfectly fine by us. You know, we don't have that spider mentality of like you have to go through us as a matter of fact, I spend probably 10 to 20% of my time working with individuals and organisations that really want to harness the community ecosystem and sharing best practices with them and how they can approach it. Because right now, yeah, we are at, we're looking at activating like 100 or 200 communities, which economically makes no sense whatsoever for a smaller individual. So um, there's no reason why, why individuals can't use these tactics or this approach um, and, uh, and, and really pinpoint the two, three, three, four, five communities. They might even be much smaller communities with 50 members or 200 members. Like what I've shared with you tonight applies to really any type of community that isn't professional as in like a Huffington Post that do, does have like high price tags. By the way, guys, please download the app, My Runway. It, it, it helps me get funding to host events like this because it's, you know, it helps me prove the value to <laughs> my managers. So I would really appreciate it. It's a free app, uh, iPhone or Android, and share your feedback on Facebook. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, we have one back there. Right at the back. <laughs> Um, yes, so uh, I work at BitTorrent, and we have so many fans um, that are very active, but only on their own. Um, and I was just wondering if anybody has any uh, advice as to how to, I guess, activate them to help share the brand with their friends and people just offline. So the question is around, you've got um, countless fans yeah. and they I, I missed that bit around what yeah 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 we'd love to uh, find some way of um, activating our current fans um, you know not just on social but just in like the real world and we'd love world, to know yeah. yeah we'd love to know more about um, if you have any recommendations as to how to uh, say if you if you heard about the dig model, basically they act, they basically spread their brand through their uh, their influencers through their biggest fans, and I was just wondering if um, anybody has any advice on how to do that, especially offline, as in you're able to reach them online, but you're getting them to do things offline. Yeah, I, as as I mentioned before, there is a and it's a great question. There's a there is a clear difference between activating your fans as a brand and activating influencers amongst an audience that aren't your fans. And and you know what we live and breathe is really the latter. 